Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kubelman. Welcome to Help Desk Crash Course. The point of this course is to learn as much as possible about Help Desk in one place. And this is why on a regular basis, I would combine some of my most recent Help Desk videos on how to do Help Desk using a ticketing system from beginning to an end in very much detail. In today's video, you will learn about proxy, firewall, Citrix receiver, fixing Windows start menu, configuring blue jeans, and why simply rebooting a computer will fix it. Who knows? Let's find out. So if you're doing help desk or tech support, this video is really good for you. In my videos, I like to take time and explain how to fix things, but also how to go about realizing why things are being fixed as they are. It's one thing to just tell somebody, this is how you fix it. But do you really understand of why the issue happened and why the fix will actually fix it? So this is how I go about all my videos just to make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about and also so it's easier to follow. By the way, thank you so much to people who left kind messages for me, uh, kind comments I should say. I really appreciate it. I see you. I really do see you guys and your nice and polite comments are so motivating. I really, really appreciate it. And yes, don't worry, I will definitely uh, make more videos like this uh, as, as often as I can. But again, thank you so much, guys. I, I appreciate it. It's very, very uh, motivating. Thank you. All right. So first thing first, I'm going to assign this ticket to myself, and then I'm going to see what this is about. <clears throat> So the person that reported the issue ours is our good friend Mike Moser, and it says, <clears throat> excuse me, start button, search, and taskbar not working. And it says here, hello, my start button, search, taskbar are not working today. Uh, nothing happens when I click on them, please help, as I can't work without it. So that's pretty understandable. Uh, we definitely want our start button and search button and of course taskbar to work because without it it's it's a big big issue right especially when you're used to using those things so we definitely got to fix this and the priority on this is probably it's a medium uh, because um, you can still work technically by using desktop icons because you can select any of those and you know work with, with like that but of course if you can't use your taskbar then things get super complicated every time you open up multiple windows as they gather on the bottom anyways we'll definitely talk about that for sure uh, but first thing first uh, we got to get a hold of this customer we got to get a hold of mike and we got to ask him to give us give us his uh, host name or ip address uh, host name meaning his computer name so that way we can use remote desktop uh, software uh, to connect and take control of his computer so that way we can work on this issue Preferably, you might want to talk to him on the phone, but if you can reach out to him over instant messenger of some sort, um, that's fine too. Just make sure to let him know that you are going to take control of his computer because this is not an easy fix. All right. So here is our workstation that I use for this type of uh, for these type of issues. Um, in this workstation, everything is working fine, and uh, and that's perfectly fine because I don't want to break my computer. And the reason for that is uh, I'll tell you why uh, in a minute here. But I can't recreate it in the sense where I if I click on the start button and not work, or click in here and not working is because I would literally have to break my operating system entirely. So in his case, he cannot click on the start button. He cannot type it into search and he can't use any icons. So even if he goes over here, for example, and opens up Google Chrome or Edge or just any application that he opens up later on, he can't even click on any of these things to open up them up like that. Right. So that's a big, big problem. And the reason that actually happens is because uh, Windows service that is used for this function has stopped working. And um, every time I see this issue, that's what happens. And you can see this service in your task manager located under here. And I'll definitely explain to you how this is actually part of operating system. If you go to services tab here in the task manager, and if you scroll down here and you can see a service that's called W search, it would instead of instead of saying running, it would say stopped. And the reason uh, for it to stop 
um, is because of Windows uh, corruption. This would never be manually stopped in any way because it's set up to start automatically. So what is this Windows search? It's literally what this is here over here. So if you your start button, when you click on start button, you go in and you're searching, right? You're searching for the application that you need to use, right? So that's part of the search. Um, I know a lot of people think of as an operating system as just the one thing and that's all one thing but no operating system is actually a combination of services that are running in the background just like you can see in this window in the task manager so this part here start button search button and even the task bar is directly related to this windows search function or windows search service and for it to work properly, it has to be running just like it is here. Okay. And if you find it that it's not running, it would literally say stopped here. You know, if I stop it here, it's just going to reset itself. And Windows normally functioning doesn't care if you do this. Uh, but if you see it stopped like this, one way to restart it, and it works sometimes, but you have to keep doing it, is to uh, restart Windows Explorer. So what is Windows Explorer? When you open up a folder like this, so if you click on the folder icon, you're not actually just opening up a folder icon, you're opening up what is called Windows Explorer and you explore things with the Windows Explorer. <laughs> no, there's definitely a better way of explaining what that is. It's basically your main operating system function or main GUI, graphical user interface. Everything that you see visually, that's all graphical, right? So Windows Explorer handles that, which is <laughs> to show you uh, or to give you the ability to explore what's inside of Windows. I think that's the simplest way of explaining it. And yes, it's also a service, but it's a service that directly relies on function of other services to uh, to function and to be working properly for it to work properly as well. So when you as a temporary fix, you can restart uh, Windows Explorer. And if you go to your task manager and you scroll down, you'll see again we're looking for a folder just like we saw earlier, this folder icon. And there it is on the bottom. We can simply right click it and select restart. And whenever I do this, it's going to restart and the computer is going to computer screen is going to flash. You'll see everything that's visual here, all these icons, even the background, everything, everything. It's going to flash. That means exactly what I talked about is that Windows Explorer handles everything that you're visually looking. So let's go ahead and click restart. Right. You see how everything just kind of went dark and it came back. That's because Windows Explorer restarted and with it, it attempted to restart and, and sometimes it does all these other dependent services. You see how this is back running now, right? The status is back to running because Windows service itself, a uh, Windows Explorer service itself re reinitiated all these other services that are required to work in the background so i'm going to uh, I, I think that's a really good explanation that, that we have there i think everybody should be able to understand how that functions uh, but i can certainly reiterate that so let's go back we know that windows search function here is this this is the service and this is just a little part of this it's start search and that is that right there windows search and then we have Windows Explorer, which is everything that we see. Windows Explorer, uh, a lot of times, if it's a really, really bad situation or where the Windows is corrupted in such a way, and that, by the way, that's the main reason why this Windows search function would stop to working in, in, in to begin with. If it's corrupted really bad, this Windows search function or Windows service will not will not be able to uh, restart it at all. So what happens is, uh, in the worst case scenario, the Windows Explorer, again, everything that we're seeing here, it tries to initiate that, but it can't. So the worst case scenario is 
uh, it will stay you know just kind of blank like this and it will start to flash um, and I'm gonna restart again just to show you you see how everything goes black whenever this part is corrupted this Windows search when you are not able to reinitiate it by restarting Windows Explorer it's just going to get stuck to a point where you can't see the icons you can't click on anything and the taskbar would be flashing because it's going to continuously try to restart Windows search service but it won't be able to so again for Windows Explorer to function properly it has to have these services running in the background especially in this case Windows search because our issue is the start button and the search function uh, along with the taskbar not working properly uh, it has to have this running in the background so the reason it stops working like this and you can't reboot it is because Windows is simply corrupted so to fix that uh, the only way you can do this is to run PowerShell what we're going to do is scan the file system or I should say the operating system um, kind of a same difference is to see if it can find any corrupted files and if it does uh, then we can tell it to replace them so the command to run PowerShell and for the Windows it's for the Windows to, for PowerShell to scan the system for any corrupted files it is CFS space forward slash scan now okay and then when we hit enter it's going to start um, scanning the system for any issues Oh, you have to run it as administrator. <laughs> I forgot about that. All right. That's a good thing, actually. You guys have to know that as a administrator, you have to run things as administrator. You have to use elevator privileges for it to happen. All right. Now when I put it back in there. Okay, see ya. CFC forward slash scan now. Okay. So now it's going to start to begin this verification process. So what it's taking is literally has a template somewhere and it takes that template that says, okay, all of these system files are supposed to be there. And now it's scanning the system to see if they are there and if it can open them up and if it can run them. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that it's tried to open them up and run them because that's pretty much the only way to see if it's corrupted aside from the obvious of like for example let's say the template says our windows service um, it's supposed to be a certain size let's say it goes through and it's scanning and it scans this function and the simplest explanation is if it finds this function and it says well it's missing something let's say it's different size for example or it's missing some kind of part of data it would know you know, it would say how many bits or bytes are missing, and that would be like the main indicator right away. Like, oh, well, this is not right. We're going to have to repair it. We're going to have to replace it. So that's just one indicator, but I'm sure uh, they use some other indicators too to see if something is corrupted. All right. I'm going to wait for it to finish, and then I'm going to um, continue um, talking after it's done. All right. So it's getting close to the end of its scan. I uh, want to kind of emphasize that this scan only does is just verifies whether there's something wrong. It's not going to actually replace or repair anything. And for that, um, if if it comes up with an error where it says there's something wrong, some of these files are corrupted, you will have to uh, run a specific command which I have written down here so we can actually go in and it's going to update and repair any of the system files. So it says here, uh, Windows uh, resource protection did not find any integrity violation so it didn't find any problems with the system files that I currently have on the system of course because we know that everything is working fine on this specific computer but if you're working on a user's computer uh, chances are that if you have this type of issue you will get a problem notification even even if you don't you can still run this command 
and it will go ahead and 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 do its thing it will go online and it would uh, download and reinstall um, any missing files or corrupted files which I'm not going to run now but here is our uh, command that we're going to type in that we would type in in Windows PowerShell which would execute that operation all right so it's DISM forward slash or space forward slash online telling it that these are online uh, files that it needs to get and then the function of cleanup image you know it's going to you know restore and, and check to see what it's missing and replace anything that needs to be done and of course uh, you know restore health um, and yeah that that that's what it does after that is completed your start button um, and search function should be working properly as intended if it doesn't um, then in that case you have to re re reimage reinstall windows uh, unfortunately but this should and it does fix it most of the time all right now we're going to go back to our ticket so what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, I have repaired search functions on the user's computer save and I'm going to complete this ticket all right guys thank you so much for watching I appreciate it I hope you like this type of video uh, I I know a lot of people like the way I explain things let me know if you're new because I know majority of people who watch my videos are actually um, not subscribed uh, which is which is fine uh, but you know if you happen to be new or just accidentally come across my video let me know if you like these type of explanations what I share is real world examples and uh, I, I try to um, explain it in such a way where it makes sense the reason why you're doing it uh, the reason why it fixed it and this and that um, yeah I, I yeah enough said I suppose and uh, you have a wonderful day bye bye hello my friends my name is Irvin also known as Kobo Man. this is another ticketing system video so in this video we're going to use the Jira IT service desk ticketing system basically it's an example of a ticketing system that's used in help desk whether it's tier one tier two or or whatever else you know if you're just doing IT support for some company you might be working in some other department and still use this type of ticketing system Jira in this case being used is just an example of what ticketing system looks like and I have a uh, lots of videos using this system but again um, they're all very very similar this is just happened to be Jira so if you want to check out Jira you certainly can it's free to play around with in this video we're going to take a look at this ticket submitted by um, our reporter named Mike Moser and it says here I need help with blue jeans all right so what is blue jeans guys let's click on this ticket and see what it says here i just got blue jeans app oh okay so it's a it's an app and i need help configuring audio plus camera so that gives you an idea of what blue jeans app is so we are lucky in this case user mike moser is being fairly descriptive on what he wants what he needs done and that is help configuring audio plus camera so this kind of indicates to us that this is some kind of a conferencing or meeting type of app like zoom or webex so now we have a good idea what blue jeans might be if you've never heard of it of course you can always google blue jeans app to see what it is however if you're working for a company you should be familiar with the what the web what what the app is <laughs> excuse me so yeah blue jeans app is exactly what it is it's a meeting type of uh, system just like zoom webex uh, skype and etc so we're going to help them set this up blue jeans specifically is a verizon product and i just so happened to work for verizon so this is where i got the idea to kind of talk about this and that uh, we're going to configure blue jeans and i'll show you how to do it 
Uh, first thing that we have to do though is assign the ticket to ourselves. Every time you pick up a ticket from a system, you want to assign it to yourself so that way you can get credit and in the meantime nobody else picks up the ticket. You don't want to have two people working on the same issue. A lot of times whenever you work on a ticket, you can see that somebody else is also watching it. If, For example, if you look over here on the right, there's a little eyeball and a lot of times it will list if there's somebody else watching. And it's very similar with other ticketing systems, guys. All the ticketing systems are almost identical except the way they look, meaning the GUI, the, uh, the graphical user interface, will look different. It would just look different, but when it comes to everything else, it's going to be, you know, the same. So in this case, we're going to reach out to Mike Moser and we're going to connect to his computer and help him configure it. Or you can basically tell him over the phone, but I prefer to basically take control of the computer and just do it for them to make sure everything is running properly. Um, when it comes to notes here, we have add internal note or reply to a customer. I'm not going to reply to customer, but I'm going to assume that I have direct connect contact for Mike Moser. So I'm going to reach out to him over instant messenger. I'm going to ping him or call him if he has a number listed. Again, this is just an example of what a customer's ticket or customer's request or incident will look like. So in this case, I'm just going to reach out to Mike Moser because I've done a lot of Mike Moser tickets and uh, you can certainly check them out in my other videos. All right, so I'm going to leave the notes as they are for now. So I'm just going to reach out to Mike Moser and then I'm going to connect to his computer. Uh, the way you do that is by getting their computer name, also known as host name. All right, so we're going to pretend like we're already connected to his computer. And you, of course, you can do this different ways. And here's the first thing that usually comes up whenever you launch blue jeans for the first time. You can see me in the background because it picked up my camera right away. And chances are this is what will happen with Mr. Mike Moser. Uh, it gives you two options when it comes to audio. The main thing to consider here when it comes to this first question is that how do you usually join a meeting do you use your computer audio and it describes what that is view listen talk on the computer that means do you have basically headset headphones like this you know that you want to use with your computer that means you would use your left option there and if or if you just want to use your phone basically call into the meeting that's what this is if you want to use your phone whether it's your desk phone or your cell phone you know to call in then you want to select the right option and that means that you can view on the computer and listen and but you can be able to talk you have to use your phone to talk right so in this case I'm going to ask Mike, do you want to use your headset? And I'm just going to assume that he says yes. So we're going to do that. I'm going to select the use computer audio and select save and continue. And here you can see me uh, a little bit uh, in the background, which is kind of cool. This is the feature I kind of like uh, when it comes to blue jeans. Um, it's actually pretty modern and it works really well, actually. I'm not just saying that because I actually work for Verizon, uh, but it is actually a pretty good product. So Typically, what you want to do is type in your email address. So, for example, um, if I type in Mike Moser at, I don't know, Verizon.com, this is what I would use to log in. And if I select next, it would automatically log me in. And then that, that would be that. And then we can join the meetings afterwards. Um, you can also join meetings by getting a link from um, the person that's, that started the meeting. Um, in this case, this is not going to do anything, uh, but this is what Mike would most likely have to do. Again, we're doing this as a pretend thing, so uh, this is what he would do. But in this case, so just to keep it moving, we're going to select join as guest. And here it is. You can see me. Hello. It's been a while, I know, but uh, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. And here we are. I'm just going to mute video just for a moment here. Uh, we know that the camera works. We know that the camera works. So if we want to enable it, we can simply just select unmute video. And then I am back. You can see me, obviously. It's really easy, really simple. I'm going to mute. That means that nobody can see me. Right, very simple. You can see it. It's a big indicator. I really like how the whole background 
is basically taken up with your camera and to double check that we can simply go down here and make sure that the camera itself is selected i'm just going to actually point see if that works out well right there it's actually pretty can i do it right there so we're going to see make sure that it's selected right there and it indeed it says you know it's a webcam that it's selected in my case it's hd pro webcam c920 and and if they have a like a laptop you would simply select their laptop camera okay and for a microphone we got it right here we have to make sure that their uh, microphone that they want to use where did i put it right here this microphone for their headset we want to make sure that is selected right there right so it's very simple we just click on the menu here and then we want to make sure that that one is selected it says here that it's a plantronics you know c plantronics 610 in my case and you know make sure that that one is connected now we have microphone connected and then the last thing is right here we have speakers we want to make sure that the speakers are connected and same deal uh, we want to make sure that our speakers are connected and you can see here that c610 is connected and now whenever he puts his headset on he can you know work as normal he can view he can they can people can see him just like this and uh, people can hear him we know it's selected right there he can hear people because it's selected right there if he wants to turn off the camera again it's right up here and then if he wants to mute himself he would just simply click mute all right that's all straightforward we have helped him configure it and install it and this is you can do this for yourself really easy when it comes to joining a meeting um you can simply just type in the meeting id right here and the passcode if there is one and then just type in your name in this case i'm just going to type in Irvin. Uh, but you know it's mike so we're just going to say mike uh mike m and that way whenever you join meeting um it will uh um it will let you you know use it simple so that's how you configure it and it's very simple we've showed him how, how to do it and if he wants to like start his own meeting it's really simple actually once he logs in and right now i'm not logged in but remember how i showed you he would log in with his uh his uh, uh email address he can simply there would be a button down here it just says join meeting and he would start a meeting and then you would in the middle it would it would give you a link and then you just copy link it'll be just it's simple it's very simple it's like you just click copy link and then send it to your co-workers and then they can just simply click on the link and join your meeting but now since he just wanted the configuration and you can give him a quick tour which is how to start a meeting and join meeting it's very simple you just tell him to click join meeting it doesn't say create meeting or anything like that you just click join meeting and it's going to start a meeting for you you're going to create your own um, and then you can share that link with other people and now they can hear you, see you, and then you can hear them as well. All right, now let's close our ticket here. We're going to add internal note. We're going to say helped Mr. Moser configure blue jeans. Save. And we're going to close it as resolved ticket so now when we go back to our queue it's gone we've finished uh, doing the main ticket that was there so yeah i'm actually curious if anybody else who watches this video actually works for verizon i can't see i mean i don't know maybe other companies use blue jeans as well but i know obviously verizon works and i happen to be working for them uh, this is purely coincidental i've never actually said anybody on this channel that i work for verizon but i do i work in their it department and uh, as a business systems analyst and i do work tickets uh, maybe i don't know maybe some people will recognize me <laughs> uh, whenever uh, they see this video if you happen to work for verizon uh say hi <laughs> uh, you know, anyways if, if you want to all right, guys, thanks for watching. I hope this is useful for folks that are into help desk and IT, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.
Welcome my IT friends. This is another video on how to complete a ticket. We're using Jira ticketing system and this is a very interesting ticket that we're going to solve. In this video we'll show you how to check for proxy issues and for firewall issues. So stay tuned for that. This is a really good training uh, video for just anybody, just about anybody who works IT, whether you're a desktop support, help desk, systems administrator, or whatever else. Um, I just want to say thank you for all people that became members of my channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, let's check out our ticket. This is a Jira ticketing system. This ticket says I can't use, use Google.com. And it says in the description, I can't use Google.com. All other web websites work fine. So in this pretend scenario this is just a made-up person mike moser and in this case he submitted a ticket about this specific issue but there are many many other reasons why google.com would not work in this case we're going to pretend that it's not a case of a bad link or anything like that it's just simply every other website works but when he goes to google.com it doesn't work this is why we're going to concentrate on proxy or possibly firewall issues at local level all right, first thing first, I'm going to assign ticket to myself, make sure I get credit for my work, and now we're going to continue from here. Here's what's going on. I'm going to contact Mike here and say, hey, is it okay um, that I take control of your computer? What I usually say is, hello, my name is Irvin. May I take control of your computer? And then I'm going to take control of his computer just so I can troubleshoot. All right, and let's pretend that we already did that. So we're going to pretend that this is his computer. So what happens is he would go to google.com and it wouldn't work like it's normally working here. Uh, so it would be an error that might be very specific, but I'm going to say that it's a specific error to the sense that would say something like, website blocked by security google search so here's an example it says restricted website blocked and you know it gives you a different option this is kind of what i'm kind of thinking about when it comes to this ticket and everything works except the website is blocked access is denied all right now that we know what kind of issue it is, everything else works fine, we're going to look at local proxy settings. So, so to get to the local proxy settings, we will go to the search bar. This is the quickest way of getting to it and just type in internet net options. Okay. And this here, this internet option, uh, whatever changes you make, uh, when it comes to proxy settings will affect any browser that you're using. In this case, I'm just using Edge um, just because I don't have anything else installed on here. But if you're using IE, Chrome, Firefox, all of the settings that you change in Internet Options will affect that. So let's say you change proxy settings, it will affect that for all of those browsers. Okay. However, generally speaking, um, this internet option, it was designed for IE in mind. And so, for example, if it says here homepage microsoft.com. Uh, we can just change that to, uh, let's say, google.com and see. And just to show you that these settings here normally would apply to IE only, but not when it comes to proxy settings. So I don't have IE installed, I don't think, but let's do home. Well, see, it's not affecting Edge at all. Do I have IE installed? IE. Oh, I do. Okay, excellent. I didn't think I did. And here it is. Uh, okay, whatever. Use recommended settings. This is the first time starting IE, so you can tell that I've never, um, I've never uh, initiated this, or I haven't initiated this on this fresh install of Windows. Fairly fresh. So that what that was asking us: What do you want your homepage to be? And you can see that it went to Google.com and, you know, Microsoft wouldn't necessarily want that to begin with. But just to kind of show you that this is what happens here, I'm just going to do it real quick. I'm just going to change it to Yahoo.com. Matter of fact, to my own website, CosmicNovo.com, IE. Oh, it didn't like that. Look at that. Oh, look at this. An unknown program wants to change your homepage to 
look at this this is very very interesting it hasn't been like this before guys it would just do it and it would just work but now did you see that that is very very interesting did we lose our internet options ha huh. and look at that it reverted back to google.com https cosmic novo.com apply unknown program it says it's unknown program yet it's their own microsoft program look now it worked fine probably because i didn't have http in front of it that's very very interesting anyways this is my website if you want to check it out okay now back to internet options i don't know why i closed it but here it is this is where you would check for proxy settings so what is a proxy Proxy is basically a server that routes your traffic. So the reason for it is to filter and monitor traffic in a business type of environment. So instead of just going directly to, you know, in this case, CosmicNova.com, uh, you would go through this proxy server that then will allow you to access CosmicNova.com. And that's found here under LAN settings. So just to kind of double, just kind of go over it again, if you click connections tab in internet options and go to LAN settings, this is where you would find proxy settings. By default, as you can see, it automatically detects settings. It's set to automatically detect settings and that's fine uh, because you don't have a proxy on your computer. It'll just say, oh, okay, well, there is no proxy. So I'm just gonna do it normally. However, if you're using a server this would be checked here use automatic configuration script this is just one option of doing it and it would be something like i don't know http um s i suppose and then it could be any website in this case we're going to pretend it's cosmicnovo.com and then we're going to uh, change it to script.cgi bin so the reason I set it to CGI bin, CGI bin is basically a, a folder that has scripts inside of it. Uh, so there is a server at this location and it has a folder called CGI dash bin. Inside of that folder uh, will have scripts that will interact with the web pages that will basically filter traffic, monitor traffic, this and that. So that's one way which you would typically see in a business environment and of course you can use a proxy server uh, that you can manually set and just by typing in ip address here with the port and then it's sort of like a vpn right a vpn functions the same way uh, you would just type in the ip address you want to connect to or a server and that your traffic will go through that so this is more kind of a simplified while this one here has a, a scripts that run that are way more complex and it can do all these things that i've uh, mentioned before filter traffic monitor traffic and this and that okay that's how you check and change settings when it comes to proxy um, servers so yeah it typically um, this will be here uh, just this is not as used as much but I mean it just depends on the business but typically nowadays it's this here because it's more flexible it gives you more options to control the flow of internet traffic so to kind of make sure that his LAN settings are correct we would go in here and make sure that this is set up correctly right so now we know this looks good now we can move on from that if you still can't use it and again, we're assuming that the website is actually working for everybody else and it's not um, an issue for, um, it's not an issue when it comes to being just to be in a wrong link. Now we're going to move on to other things that might be causing the problem. All right. Next thing we're going to talk about is a firewall. So to get to the firewall that I'm talking about, um, just go ahead and type in uh, Windows Firewall and what we're looking for is actually a setting for advanced uh, firewall rules so we're going to select the first thing that comes up here which is windows defender firewall and advanced security 
All right, so we have inbound and outbound rules. This is kind of what you would get and what you would see in a business environment. This would just all be blank and it would say, it's managed by your organization. So all of these things that are in here will be managed by your organization and chances are you wouldn't see anything. But I just kind of wanted to sh show you in, or explain to you how these things work in general. So we got inbound rules, meaning that any, um, these are rules for any inbound connection. So let's say you're using a program, for example, and that program is, it needs to work uh, based off somebody or something sending it some kind of data so inbound it's coming the data is incoming so it's inbound so from the outside somebody is trying to connect to us to either send us or you know just to kind of send us some kind of data it's trying to it's coming inbound so all these rules for inbound connections will be in here same thing for outbound if you have a program that's trying to reach out um, to something uh, from your computer to you know get data from that uh, internet uh, location or whatever that may be. It could just be a website. Uh, all these uh, rules will be in here. All right, so let's let's go ahead and create a couple of them. Here's for inbound, just to make it um, easy to understand. We're going to select inbound rules uh, folder. Then we're going to, over on the right side, we're going to select new rule. So what we're going to do here is just we're going to create a rule that would block a program, just to kind of, uh, make it easy to understand of course you got other options to for port uh, predefined and custom now again to make it easy to understand we're going to block a program for inbound connection so we're going to prevent a program from receiving any outside data from anything that's outside anything that's on the internet and then uh, we're going to select a program path of course we can select all programs here and we just create a rule for that but we're going to specifically say um i don't know what, what what can we block that we can test well let's block edge let me just see where edge is located i actually haven't looked to see where edge is um, installed to be honest since i don't hardly ever use edge microsoft edge Okay, here, well, here it is. So we're going to get this path where edge is. We're going to point it to edge. Let's just sign to see. Here we go. The program path. So we're going to block edge from a, any inbound traffic. So we have to specify. All right. Go there. And we're going to select the executable. So we're going to tell it this is the executable, the application for edge. We're blocking edge from receiving any data from the outside we're going to click next and we're going to select all the connection I'll, or i should say block all the connection here if you want to allow you can create the rule but we're going to block all the connections we're going to go next and then you can select um where the where it applies to where does the rule apply does it apply at the domain level does it apply at private level or public level are you going in which, with which type of a network environment is your computer connected to? So it could be a work computer, it could be a home computer, or it could be a public computer, meaning on the network itself. So let's say you go to a coffee shop with your laptop, that will be a public. Private is home, domain is work. Okay, so we're going to leave all of this so that makes that even if I, it doesn't matter where I go to. A business home or somewhere public all of it's going to apply to all of these every time i look, look connect to that network that's there so just to kind of reiterate here uh j let's say you take your laptop to a public place you connect to that wi-fi there that's public place public network you know just to, i want to make sure you guys understand this so all of this selected we're going to block it for all these situational uh places so we're going to say uh, blocked edge that's the name it's all all it's asking is just blocked edge and we're going to select finish now Microsoft Edge is blocked for any inbound now we can see what happens here and see if, if it's working uh, some things will not work but since we're um, since edge is still allowed to access the internet um, it's going to work fine for the most part unless you're trying to receive data for example 
um, something is trying to send you something so that may not work properly uh, I'm just trying to see if I can show you an example of that's okay if it doesn't work here we're going to block it block the outbound as well right now it's just basically reaching out itself it's not there there's nothing trying to reach to it so nothing is allowed to send to it so it's probably going to work fine all right now we're going to block it on the outbound as well that's when we're going to see it not working at all all right now we have outbound selected we're going to create a new rule we're going to do the same thing basically um, we're going to select leave it at program we're going to tell us the path of the program and then we're going to select Microsoft Edge uh, we're going to select uh, next we're going to block leave it at block connections and then we're going to go next now block edge so it's basically the same thing except it's just for outbound all right now let's see if it works all right so let's see what happens see now you're starting to see how things are starting to break you see how some things are not working uh, these are probably catched or local files that are already downloaded so this is what you're seeing here this is a saved local copy but you can see that new things that are trying to pop in are broken because we blocked the connection all right now let's go to google.com now see what happens all right and see here it is this is exactly what I wanted to get to you guys get to the point uh, where I show you this guys uh, this is what happens and this is the example that I kind of wanted to point out that sometimes the issue could be with the firewall now we 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 apply the firewall here ourselves we we made the changes so if your firewall is managed by a company then this is something you may have to reach out to whoever has the ability to change firewall rules for google.com for it to allow to work and this is just a really good in my opinion explanation to tell you what's going on however in the business environment you wouldn't have any control over it what you're seeing here would not be visible to you but i wanted to make sure that you understand of what's happening and how firewall works on a basic basic level all right now let's go to open this we're going to click allow okay see now we've clicked so that it's allowed for the outbound you're going to same do the same thing for inbound we're just going to double click it we're going to allow and now we're going to refresh and there it is it's working perfectly fine all right guys i hope i hope uh you find this useful where's my jira help desk here it is I hope you find this useful i'm going to just go in and close the ticket like you're supposed to every time you work a ticket and um, we're going to say add internal note of what we did changed firewall rules to allow for google.com to work i have no idea why this changed to this that is weird all i did was type in google.com ah whatever anyways that's bizarre i'm gonna try this again google.com look at that i how bizarre i don't understand why it's happening here anyways that's bizarre it it's i, I blame the ticketing system Anyways, do I still, I need to close the ticket. Here we go. Waiting, completed, done and done, guys. That's that. Again, thank you all for supporting my channel. I really appreciate it. I'm trying to make as many videos as I can. I also want to mention again that I appreciate all the people that became members. Um, and it's certainly not required or anything like that, but it's definitely noticeable. And I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm also um, trying to utilize any money that I make on this channel towards a better production 
and more quality videos. I don't know if you've noticed some of my recent videos, like I made one that's called Top 20 Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. Um, I actually hired a professional uh, to help me with that. And I also have a new one coming up, which is going to be Top 20 Network Interview Questions and Answers. And all of those, I make it so that not only just give you answer, but also show you how to do it or give you a better explanation, just so it's a better quality uh, content for you guys. Thanks again, guys. I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobume. Welcome to another help desk tutorial. This can also be used for desktop support. If you guys are doing desktop support, some kind of tech support at some kind of company, like in an office, or, or do some kind of remote support, this, these videos are really good. Check out my other videos, too. I have a lot of these. All right, so today's Take It is about Citrix. We're going to talk about Citrix. I think few people have requested it in the past, and I've noticed somebody recently also uh, requested a Citrix video and I've been postponing it and there's a really good reason for that. But before we get into it, please take a moment to like this video. I really appreciate it. And I also want to give big thank you to people that became members of my channel. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. All right. So this ticket is about Citrix not working from our good friend, Mike Moser. He says, hi, my Citrix is not working. So we're going to talk about Citrix and we're going to talk about Citrix from the point of view of user or from point of view of help desk or tech support, not necessarily from somebody who set up Citrix um, services or for example, cloud services to host uh, Citrix, uh, you know, web apps, stops or whatnot. Okay, so let me tell you why I postponed it. For me to talk about it on a server level, you actually have to pay a license or pay money in order to even view it or even install it or to have any access to it. So I can't show you a video on a uh, point of view of a server, how it's set up on the server level. And I also don't want to get fired because I don't want to show, I can't show it on my, uh, at my job. You know what I mean? It's not allowed. It's a big security thing. And also, so if, for example, here, I'm not going to just, talk about it. I'm just going to show you. So if you go to citrix.com and if you go to downloads and you want to download the server uh, workspace, uh, you have to register it. You have to register under your full name, uh, work email, company name, job title, country, phone number, etc. and etc. This is just to request a demo of it. But anyways, you have to show, you know, put in your real address, your real phone number, your everything, so they can sell you this service. This is usually somebody who owns a business that needs Citrix set up for their business. All right, but that's okay. We're going to talk about it uh, from user point of view. This is what users use it uh, for. They use it to access, uh, you know, remote apps. Some people nowadays call it a cloud, everything hosted in a cloud, but it's on a server, right? It's just on a server, which could be a network or somewhere, or they can even be set up on some you know, web web services like uh, uh, Google Cloud or AWS, right? Amazon uh, version of that. So, but this user, he's just simply using it from his computer. He's using it probably just to access a remote desktop. All right, so let's go to this demo website that I have. I'm going to just copy pasta it. Hold on just a moment here. This is my website, by the way. Uh, CosmicNova.com if you want to check it out. They have some cool articles on there. Anyways, this is the website and it's a demo website that somebody else created. It's not fully functional, but it'll give you an idea of how what happens is user usually has a link and they go to this website and the website's like, you know, trying to look for Citrix Receiver, which is the desktop app that they use to connect to this remote desktop. So it's a kind of like an inception, uh, if you will. So they're using their own desktop to access another desktop, but that's a remote. So it's a remote desktop, right? That's what it does. And now it's saying, well, you don't have Citrix receiver, uh, but you can download it from us directly. And this is what usually happens. Um, it, the website itself that's hosting uh, the, uh, the service, uh, whether it's, you know, app or just a desktop, remote desktop, will offer you an ability to download and install Citrix receiver locally. And this could be the issue with Mike Moser here. Uh, what it does is it actually downloads this thing, which is called Citrix Receiver. It's a very tiny program. 
and we'll actually go to the website website will I'll show you this it's for 41 megabytes and installs usually silently if it's coming from a website not necessarily but it depends how it's set up uh, what's replacing it is actually Citrix workspace app so Citrix receiver I think they stopped making them in or stopped uh, making new versions of Citrix receiver in 2018 so now they're switching over to Citrix workspace app which is essentially the same thing it's just kind of a different naming scheme and maybe there is more to it well but essentially they do the same thing okay so here's Mike at his website and he, can, he can't log into it usually you know he's able to just log in and then he launches Citrix and it's working fine in this case uh, this is the problem so we're just going to click agree and it will be the same difference as if I try to install Citrix receiver uh, when I click install it's going to download and install it and here it is you can see that it's a matter of fact it's the exact same size and here it is Citrix receiver web.exe 41.4 and technically it's a plugin if you will but it's more of like a an app that's installed on your computer so i'm going to click run so that way it installs it right away so a lot of times this is silent and it just does it in the background for most users uh, but anyways we're going to have to do it we're going to have to give it admin privileges to do it and it kind of gives you an explanation of what it is you see it says citrix receiver install software allows you to use virtual applications uh, that, that your organization provides including software that allows you access to the application to use your browser so yeah, Centrix will, you know, when, once it installs, it's going to launch it. It's going to launch it within your browser, but it will be like a remote desktop. Um, a lot of times it won't even look, it won't even look like remote desktop. Like what I'm doing right now, I'm just using regular remote desktop to remote into this computer called Stream that's on my local network. Uh, but with Citrix, it will just be like a web page. And if that web page might just have like IE pulled up you know just an example and be very very limited this is why Citrix server can host a lot of these uh, instances and it says here allows applications to use your webcam microphone you know anyways it's like a computer basically um, that when it comes to remote desktop part of it uh, also same I guess with virtual uh, applications so we're going to install it and just kind of see what happens now once we install it so it's going to take I don't know like 10 15 seconds to install it it's a very small package as i've mentioned and here's another thing that come up you see how it's saying on the bottom it's trying to the website is trying to open it right but it realizes that it's a risk and when it's installed silently when it's installed silently users can miss this easily right it says here this web page wants to run the following add-on Right, so it installs it is also as an add-on, right? Because it's using your um, IE in this case, Internet Explorer, to you know show you that remote desktop session that I talked about. And this is what users sometimes miss. Usually, they go to the website, they install, install silently. They don't get these pop-ups. Basically, they don't it doesn't ask you do you want to install this and that like we went through just now. It would just do it, but then it would pop up this, and they miss this part of it. And of course, if you trust this server, you can just click allow. You can click, you know, allow for all websites, but I wouldn't recommend that. But for this case, we're just going to click allow because we know exactly that the user is allowed to use this. This is part of their job. So we're going to click allow and they miss this, right? This They miss this and they could cause a problem. And here it is. Uh, this is basically modifying, you know, security settings uh, for your IE or your internet settings, if you will. And now you have to click allow again just to kind of confirm that it's okay to run Citrix and use your IE and connect to these, you know, remote um, services, or remote desktop sessions or whatnot. So we're going to click allow, but I also check do not show me this warning for this program again, because I don't want a user to come back to me later and says, hey, it's not working or, uh, you know, tell me, hey, there is an Internet Explorer security warning. I don't know what to do. So we're just going to make make sure that it doesn't happen again and going to do a check mark here. Don't show me this warning for this program again. And we're going to click allow. All right. So now the website basically refreshed itself and now it's going to come to a point where user can log in. So right now we're using the Citrix receiver itself, except it's embedded. It's embedded um, into here. So and then, of course, you can see the Citrix receiver. Um, if you go to your add ons, you can see that it's right there. You see it Metro Citrix ICA client and it's running. It's enabled and just says it's 32 bit it doesn't matter uh, but anyways it's there and it's enabled of course if you if it's not working and 
it's it, you know it says disabled here of course just click to enable it you know you can just right click enable or or dis disable so that that's another thing you might want to kind of consider if it's not running and you know it's installed so this may take a bit to load but usually it's going to it's going to come to a point where it's going to ask them to log in and it's going to be a web interface and it's going to say well we got a bunch of these apps you can run this or that or you know or you can just I don't know. It, it, there are so many options. Again, I sorry I can't show you this on the server level because, you know, number one, I can't afford the license. Um, you know, I I can't afford to pay for this to show you. But number two, you know, I, of course I can't show you this at my work. I, even at my work, I'm not the guy who actually um, supports Citrix uh, server. But even either way, I wouldn't be able to show you because I could lose my job. It's a security risk. And number three, actually, is that from desktop point of view, uh, this is all you need to know from help desk point of view. And again, I see I mentioned that this website is not necessarily working great. And it says here, cannot complete your request. But I'm going to click OK and we'll see what happens. Maybe we can get it to at least come to a point where it's going to allow us to log in. Anyways, this uh, demo that's set up god knows where i don't even know who who made this or set up i am just glad it didn't exist so we can get to a point where it shows you what it would look like if you were to try to support this for any of the users in our case mr mike moser so the main thing is here is to make sure that citrix receiver is installed and it's allowed to run now in our case again this is just not a working website uh, let me see if this actually works in edge just to see maybe we're lucky enough to get it to come up uh, up to a login maybe now oh, there it is see uh, this is the website this is you would just basically log in uh, well it looks like it's already pre-filled out let me see if, yeah i can't log in so this is probably abandoned somewhere but this you know this is basically what happens we know that citrix receiver is now working and because we know it's coming up to the login point and whenever they log in they'll be able to click on app that they want to run which will open up a new pop-up window that will have the citrix session in it you know just a new window you know like this open and it would have uh, Citrix inside of it and then they can use it let's see what else can i do and show you uh, when it comes to troubleshooting this there's also another space another place if you're having trouble in installing citrix receiver there's another place you can uh, basically reset it if it's not working what happens is it downloads the uh, citrix receiver in your downloads folder right so if we go to the to downloads maybe i no we remember we select run we didn't actually save it sorry so <laughs> it would be here if you actually selected the save right instead of me just clicking run it would be here another thing we can go through is go to c go to the user's local profile right now i'm logged in as kobo man let me get this moved here and then of course we're going to go to app data if you don't see app data of course make sure you click on view and highlight show hidden items or you can just type in app data in here but if we go back we can see that app data folder is there this is where we need to go now it's been a while since i've actually troubleshooted citrix but looks like it's going to be under local sometimes it's under roaming sometimes it's in both but let's check it out here here it is citrix and we know that we've kind of installed it a few minutes ago it says 3 58 p.m uh that that's when it was installed uh right now it's 4 4 p.m so that's about right here is our citrix receiver right here uh there are some logs there are some dll's uh in the nutshell if you have problems with receiver you can go to add remove programs and we're just going to remove it right we're going to remove it and we're going to uninstall it and if it doesn't remove anything because if it's a corrupted version of search let's say there's a new version that the server is using and this is why it's not working uh, we might want to do a clean install uh, you've probably seen of you know some software that lets you clean your system and do a clean install of like drivers and a lot whatnot this is kind of what we're going to do right now and we'll see uh, Citrix, you know, and, you know, and uh, a lot of software will remove any remnants of itself. In this case, it didn't remove. So we got a bunch of stuff that's left over from it. You know, uh, I know there are no DLLs, but if there's anything in here that could cause problems, uh, we can do a clean uh, removal, which is just simply delete, or you can just rename the folder and it's going to re reinstall it again. So if I run Citrix here again, you know let's say we did save on it and we install it it's going to create a new folder in here called citrix 
and then it's going to be clean and fresh install of it just in case because I've seen some buggy issues with Citrix and that's just another way of, of, of trouble. There it is. You see how it appeared right now and it's at 4.05 p.m. Anyways, guys, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm just uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys reminded me to make this video and uh, I'm going to add internal notes. Fixed Citrix by repair. I'm just going to keep it simple. So that way my boss, if he ever checks out my tickets, he can see that I did something. And usually boss wants to know how you did it. But you don't want to be super descriptive uh, because, you know, users sometimes get confused about the things you've done, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, keep it simple. Just make sure that you state what you did to fix it. And then close your ticket. Guys, thank you so much for watching. More videos to come. I'm trying to make more more time to or trying to set more time aside to create more videos and as always there will be regular videos coming out in regards to this type of setup I suppose I think most people uh, that are into IT and following me for IT uh, content like this setup where I use this ticketing system and kind of show you what it kind of looks like uh, when you're dealing with um, real issues and kind of what it would look like if it was a real customer and a real ticketing system type of thing. Uh, please check out my other videos. If you have any comments, please leave them below. And don't forget to like. I really appreciate that as well. Take care. You have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. So if you ever had a hand an issue with your computer and you just rebooted it and it fixed it, you magically realize that it, everything started working. You could have had many different issues and for some reason when you reboot, uh, it the problem is, is solved. And you've also seen this type of stuff if you are doing IT support, um, especially a help desk. You tell a user, and just go ahead and reboot the computer and let's see what happens. And I'd say about 50% of the time, roughly speaking, um, it fixes the issue. So why does rebooting the computer fix any of these issues? Well, there are many reasons and I'm just going to go off the top of my head and just kind of go through the ones that I think are the most likely the reason to fix these issues. All right. So number one, in my opinion, is device driver. So if you go to the device manager, you'll see that there are some things that haven't been installed like in this case you know it says other device this could be anything and the reason it could be listed like that is simply because you haven't rebooted after you've installed the drivers so let's say you got a new video card um, or some kind of a memory controller or just any type of extension card that you've installed in your computer and now it simply looks like this and you've installed the drivers and it's just sitting there and yet still not working so until you complete the install uh, which means that you actually have to reboot the computer it's not going to complete initializing the hardware and software um, connection between those two things so yes you gotta reboot the computer because remember everything starts from the bios meaning at the post meaning that every time you start a computer there's a little tiny part of <laughs> computer itself called bios that controls all the pieces of hardware and it has to know uh, what is controlling that type of hardware after it leaves bios i mean it never really leaves bios but visually you see your computer boot into windows and it has to know how to um, integrate into the windows or how to utilize windows and for it to happen it has to reboot and kind of start from the beginning you know you get that you know you start from bios your computer's like oh yeah you have these this this hardware this is these are this is all the hardware you have and then and when it boots to windows it says oh yeah you have a driver that actually controls this hardware and this is why rebooting will fix these and this is kind of what it looks like here is when you haven't either install the new driver or is just waiting for a reboot. But, you know, most of the time, to be honest, this is just means that the driver hasn't been installed at all. But you can, have, you can have a situation where you install a driver and everything looks fine. For example, let's look at the dis display adapter, um, like, like this Intel, but it could be anything. It could be like an NVIDIA GPU or AMD GPU, and it may look like it's installed. And 
uh, you know, some them, some of them you don't have to install, but it's a good, or some of them you don't have to reboot, I should say, but it's a good idea to reboot nonetheless. So it may look normal, but when you reboot, it suddenly starts working. Yep, there you go. That's the first one. <laughs> And second reason, it could be that some software actually needs to wait for it to reinstall or to reboot. Uh, reason behind that is because of integration once more. You see a lot of times it's an integration issue and that's when it comes to the technical part of it. For example, if I was to install this uh, mini remote control service for Dameware, Dameware is a remote desktop uh, a program that kind of uh, integrates itself in a sense where it takes control of other computers. Anyways, this might be a too confusing of an example. Let me actually talk about some other um, some other software that might be easier to explain. Let's see here. Let's talk about Hyper-V. I'm not sure if I have Hyper-V installed on this uh, computer, but let's see here. When you want to install Hyper-V, Hyper-V is a virtualization software that basically lets you create uh, different versions of Windows virtual operating system within the Windows that you already have. So let's say you have a powerful computer and you want to create another version of your computer as in Windows, as in a virtual Windows, you can use Hyper-V and other software too. But in order to install Hyper-V, um, you have to activate it and, and install it and initialize everything else. Let me see, where is the Hyper-V? Here it is. Hyper-V. So Hyper-V is Microsoft's virtual version of the uh, virtual uh, virtual PC software. So for example, if you are thinking about servers and, and cloud, cloud computing, they will have a server that has super, that's super powerful, has multiple CPUs, tons of RAM. They use these type of tools to create mini virtual servers on that. So for that to happen, uh, you have to reboot. So let's say you're installing this type of software. You have to reboot because that server that you're using has to share its resources, meaning its network adapter, its RAM, its CPU power. And in order for it to initialize again, it has to start from the beginning. So it's a good idea to reboot afterwards. A third reason I can think of is background services. So if you open up Task Manager, you can see that there are a bunch of different background services, background processes, if you will. And you might wonder, well, what are what are these things? If you're not, you know, familiar with computers, you you would be like, okay, I don't know, I don't know what's going on here. But I'll tell you the reason why you might want to reboot the computer. Here's an example of anti-malware service executable. So this is anti-malware, antivirus, if you will. And this a lot of times needs to reboot your computer to start initializing itself from the beginning of the boot up of your computer. So not necessarily from the BIOS or hardware sense, but from the software. So you can see how we're now getting into the software side and why you would want to reboot your computer in order to make them work properly. This antivirus or anti-malware needs to start running before any other component of the Windows. So anything that's inside of this Windows operating system, this has to be one of the first things that starts up because it wants to and it needs to start before any viruses or any malware might be on your computer. So if you have a virus that's good at blocking antivirus, you know, you want to start it first. You know what I mean? You want to start your antivirus before your virus starts. And that's the reason why you want to reboot your computer. And, you know, it, it will not work most of the time unless you reboot the computer anyway. So even if you install some kind of a third party uh, like McAfee, um, I don't know, Immunet, that's one I use sometimes. And uh, anyways, you have to reboot in order for antivirus to work properly. And that's very very crucial and it also goes for other products here it is here's dameware dameware is a product that lets me control this computer remotely although i am using it right now with a, just a regular rdp as in a remote desktop protocol for for windows uh, but this has to be running in the background so if this is not running in the background you will not be able it will not when it will not work right so it needs to start up as in on your computer startup and this usually happens 
on the startup. See where it is startup here? You can see that there's Daimler right there. And it, if this doesn't start, it says enabled, um, it's not going to work, obviously. You won't be able to remote into this computer using this Daimler uh, remote desktop session. Otherwise, and a lot of times if you see it that it's disabled, rebooting it will re-enable it although this here is literally here disabled you can see you can enable disable uh, but you have to make sure that it's enabled to begin with but this is why um, the rebooting the computer will fix it because these services will suddenly stop working and this could be caused by anything it could be just some kind of weird change it could be just opening up a different program these background services will stop sometimes and this is why rebooting the computer will fix it now moving on and this is kind of a segue to it if you're having for example audio issues you know let's say you open up your audio here sound settings and this ties in with pretty much everything what i talked about earlier whether it's hardware initialization or um, <clears throat> audio initialization rebooting the computer uh, will allow these things to um, initialize properly together so if you have audio issues that are not working rebooting the computer chances are will fix it but that's also related to the type of audio that you use if you're using regular uh, type of audio connectors those um, uh, those jacks that you plug into the front of your computer you know those 3.5 millimeter ones you have one separate for 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 speakers and one separate for a microphone may not necessarily uh, be applicable to that because that's completely separate from for example USB and USBs are notorious for not working unless you reboot the computer so you can go ahead and try this on your own especially with USB thumb drives and USB headsets um, audio headsets um, you would plug it into one and then it suddenly stopped working so what happened well the computer kind of associates your hardware as in your headset or your usb thumb drive with that with that usb that you just plugged it in so he wants to keep using that to keep it separate from anything else that might be plugged in so he wants to memorize that while the computer is running and then suddenly it stops working and then naturally the first thing you do is try to plug it into a different usb so once you do that it it, it doesn't work sometimes because it's trying to uh, use something that Windows simply is not wanting it to use. It's basically saying, well, you use this other one, so I want you to keep using this first USB just to keep things separate and organized. And that necessarily, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that uh, per se, but uh, it will not let go. Uh, unless you reboot the computer and this is why audio issues and you know memory stick issues will be resolved half the time once you reboot the computer it could also be your cell phone like if you try to plug in your cell phone and try to connect to it and you have to go in and select it to share you know whatever um, whatever I should be more specific like you know if you want to tether it or if you want to um, you know move media um, files between back you know back and forth your cell phone may not work and then you try a different USB anyways all you know 50% of the time <laughs> rebooting the computer will fix this because computer itself will uh, reset itself Microsoft itself will reset itself and then it'll suddenly say oh okay now that I've rebooted I can refresh these USB devices once more starting from the BIOS and on up and now I can associate anything new that's being uh, plugged into that USB so there you go that's the part of that all right so let's move on and let's go back to our task manager and see what else can be causing uh, problems with your computer and rebooting it simply will uh, fix the problem um, another is and i know i'm going back and forth because i'm doing everything off the top of my head i don't have a script or anything this is just me sharing my knowledge if you will and another reason is to uh, run out of resources so you can see here in task manager of what kind of cpu i have here what kind of memory i have what kind of disk what kind of ethernet and what kind of gpu i have anytime you run out of resources meaning that you maximize your cpu let's say this cpu is running at 100 percent it says here it's only being used one to two percent if this ever goes 
200% and it stays there, that means that there's something in the background here that's using up all the CPU. If you see, if you sort here, you can see all the percentages of things that are using the CPU. There might be something in the background that's using 100% of it. The computer starts running slow. You can't do anything else because your computer is already being used at 100% its capacity so naturally rebooting the computer will fix it because it will kill all of these um, executable or these programs that are running in the background program services anything that's running in the background will stop working it would refresh itself and then you suddenly your computer works because you rebooted it now it's suddenly not slow anymore you know that's because you freed it up from whatever was using up uh, a lot of cpu now uh, most of the time i've seen things using up most a lot of cpu is um, anti-malware or antivirus in the background which is normal um, but it shouldn't be using 100 percent all the time it should be just scheduled occasionally and should be running in real time um, in, in the background just kind of using a little bit just like it is here and the reason another reason you could have a process that's running at 100 percent you could have a virus so you may temporarily fix the issue, but if you don't remove the virus that's taking up hundreds of CPU, then you're not going to fix the problem. It'll just be a temporary fix by rebooting it. Uh, so keep that in mind. Kind of if you look through the processes here, and if it looks sketchy, as in like, what is this thing? I've never heard of this. You can see what it is by simply like, uh, here it is. If you right click it and then you, open, you click open file location, you can see, well, what is this? What is this? And you can see that once, since we clicked on anti malware service executable and it opened up a folder where it's at, where it's installed, you can see that this, this is actually Windows Defender and it's installed on your computer. You know what Windows Defender, it's simply antivirus software. Here, here, here is its executable and it works fine. No problem whatsoever. But if you open it up and it's like, what, what is this? Then you might have a virus, you know. In that case, it's good to reboot anyways. Because remember, we talked about rebooting and making sure that anti-malware can start first before the virus. So again, same thing can be applied to memory. You see, I only have uh, 3.9 gigabytes or 4, 4 gigs, if you will, of RAM on this computer. And this is just a workstation that I have. It's a plain computer uh, that I have sitting around that I use for these type of videos. Uh, for demonstration purposes and you can see that i've already used 60 percent and this is just computer running it's not even opening up program now imagine if i started to open up programs it's going to start it's it's going to start to fill up quickly see i'm going to try to open up some things uh let's see where we at right now see we're already at 74 percent and i now only opened up outlook and uh, <laughs> and edge and you can imagine, you know, anything that's bigger than that, um, it will fill up quickly and then you would run at 100% memory. And it's it was more of a problem before in the past where computers were using a magnetic type of hard drives. Uh, the reason I'm talking about hard drives at this point is because once you run out of RAM, your computer starts to use... Um, uh, a paged memory if you will or it's uh, it's called virtual memory as well so you can find that if you go to your computer properties and advanced system settings and then you go to where is it it's been a while since I've actually won to it it's probably here I'm just kind of blind to see it performance here we go it's the first tab so and if you go to advanced you can see the virtual memory so in this computer um, if uh, my computer runs out of RAM, it switches over to using virtual memory, which for this computer is set to 704 megabytes. You can change that. But the problem is it's slow. It's very, very slow. It's not nowhere close to the speed of RAM. And it was a problem before. Uh, a lot of times it was, it's a problem now too, but not as much as it was when magnetic uh, hard drives were used. Because remember, they have to spin up and it's slow. Nowadays, we're using solid-state drives, which are pretty fast, so it's not as noticeable, but your like stuff like video games and anything that requires actual RAM, the process will be affected by that quite a bit. So if you are running at 100% RAM, uh, rebooting the computer will fix it because it will close these programs, but it will be a temporary solution. So that's another reason why you would want. So moving on, and you can see the same kind of applies to uh let's see here 
well, I was going to say Ethernet, uh, which which can be the case. Ethernet being your local uh, connection to the internet. So if you're you know downloading something and add, and it's using up all your bandwidth, of course, if you reboot, it's going to kill that program, and then suddenly your internet is going to start going faster uh, because you've killed the process that's using up all your, which could be a virus as well. You could be a virus if you go to Task Manager and scroll over, you can see what which which program is using uh, and how much is using of your network as well. Just the same way you can scroll and look at the CPU, you can look at the network. You can see that uh, remote desktop here is using, you know, 0.1 megabits per second. That's because I'm remoting into it. So that's at local network. So another reason you might want to reboot your computer is when there's no connection. So let's say you have no internet, in which case, the issue may not be with the computer itself technically so if you have a router that's been lost the lost power for example let's say the power went out in your home and then it is not able to assign an ip address to your computer sometimes you have to reboot the computer to send the signal to the router that there's a new component on the network in which case will assign a new ip address to your computer so it's not necessarily your computer that it's broken but maybe the router needs to realize that there is a new network device um, attached. So you have to reboot the router, which will fix the issue. Anyways, there are so many other issues that can fix uh, just by rebooting. You know, this type of thinking, uh, you can apply to anything. Just like, just like we talked about here, CPU, memory, and Ethernet, you can apply the same type of thinking to GPU. So you see how I'm kind of going with this. You, you, you know, I want you to start thinking about on how these things are happening in the background and why rebooting a uh, computer will resolve these things half the time, 50% of the time. In my opinion, this is just me saying it. Uh, but it resolves these issues. We've all seen this. And that's these are the reasons. I don't want you to think that, well, there was nothing wrong with the computer to begin with, begin with because there might be something wrong with the computer to begin with. And this is something you have to investigate. And it's based off of things that I just showed you. Sure, if, if, if it's a simple issue and you kind of you know, know that the reason why rebooting the computer fixed it, then you just kind of leave it at that. Let's say there's a USB issue, something like that. You reboot it and you know that's what the problem was. You know that's what fixed it, move on. But if the issue comes back right away or shortly, that means you have to look into it and rebooting a computer as a temporary solution is not a solution. I might have missed some other things that you guys might be aware of. I mean, I've been working IT um, and, and tech support for a long, long time, and there are so many different things. I'm sure I've seen some bizarre things that I probably can't remember right now, but these are some of the general things that could uh, be the reason why rebooting the computer fixes it. Uh, you know, people say, oh, you just reboot the computer, doing IT is easy. Well, you know, maybe half the time in these specific situations, but... <laughs> Most of the other time, if you're doing some serious IT support, eh, you know, it's not as easy as I wish. I wish it was as easy. Uh, but, you know, me saying the 50% is being very generous. It's more like, you know, 20%, I'd say. <laughs> All right, guys. I hope you like this video. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just hope you like it. Let me know in the comments if you if you have any other reason or if you've seen it, uh, another way of, another reason why rebooting the computer would, would fix it. All right, guys, take care. You have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.